Let's begin with prayer. Our Father in heaven, we thank you for the pictures you give us in the Bible of the hard times that you put your people through that encourage us when we go through hard times. We see that you were faithful to them even though they weren't always aware of it. We thank you that at different times you have raised up those who have delivered your people, and even though they didn't appreciate it, you delivered them anyway. We ask that you would help us to be among those who do appreciate the deliverance that you give to us, who do trust your name. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Exodus 3, Moses, at the age of 80, is at the burning bush. God comes to him and God says, I am the God of your father, the God of Abraham, the God of Isaac, and the God of Jacob. I am the God who makes promises. And I am the God who, when he makes promises, reveals the name God Almighty. And if God is Almighty, that means he can keep the promises he made. You can trust him because he is all-powerful. And if an all-powerful God makes a promise, you can trust him. And so he says, I am that God. He says that to Moses. And he says, I'm going to deliver the people from the power, from the hand of the Egyptians. God will put forth his mighty hand and deliver them from the hand of the Egyptians and bring them into a land that flows with milk and honey. Milk is glorified water, and honey comes out of trees. It is a glorified form of sweetness, we said. So just as in the Garden of Eden there was water, and there were sweet fruit on trees. Now we have even better water in the form of milk, and even better sweetness in the form of honey. Now Moses says in verse 11, Who am I that I should go to Pharaoh, that I should bring the sons of Israel out of Egypt? I tried once 40 years ago. It didn't work. So who am I? Why should I be the one to do it? There must be somebody better qualified. Besides, I've been out of Egypt for 40 years Every now and then we get rumors of what's going on down there, but I really don't know much about it. And, you know, I haven't studied this culture a whole lot. You're sending me to be a missionary to a people that I used to know a lot about, but times have changed, and I'm not sure that I'm really the best man for the job. And God said in verse 12, Certainly I will be with you. I will be. And that phrase, I will be, factors into the name Yahweh, which means I am that I am. You know that this word... Yahweh, if you put vowels with it, it comes in English, Jehovah, or it's written capital L, capital O, capital R, capital B. And it means I am, or I will be. He says, I will be with you. Anybody know the New Testament expression for God with us? Emmanuel. L meaning God as an L of him, him with Anu us. God with us. That's God's promise. He says, I'm not just God Almighty. I'm the God Almighty that's with you. I am with you. And this will be a sign, verse 12. I am with you. I will be with you. And this will be a sign to you that it's I who sent you when you brought the people out of Egypt. You will worship God at this mountain. Now Moses can think back. He can think back to how this would be a sign. Abraham went down into Egypt. And yet when we read in Genesis 13, when Abraham came up out of Egypt with great spoil, he went up into the Negev and he got with Lot and they got up on a high mountain and they looked over the whole land and divided it up. And then in verse 14 of Genesis 13, the Lord said to Abraham after Lot had left him, Lift up your eyes and look from where you're standing, north, south, east, and west. And I guarantee you he wasn't in the valley if he was able to look over the whole land, north, south, east, and west. Now I'm going to give it all to you. So when Abraham came out of Egypt, he went to a high mountain and he surveyed the whole land. And Moses can think back to that. This is going to be a sign that the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob is the one delivering them because he's going to do the same thing he always does. God is always bringing his people out of captivity and putting them on mountaintops. He does the same with Lot. He got Lot out of Sodom and Gomorrah, and the angel said, Now I want you to go up to this mountain. And Lot said, No, I don't want to go to the mountain. I want to go over here to this city called Zoar. And they said, Well, okay, if you're determined not to go to the mountain, then you can go over here to Zoar and die. Well, Lot winds up living in a cave. Too bad. He could have gone to the mountain. 
This is the God who takes people out of captivity and offers them a mountain. And so this is the sign, you see, that this is the same God. The same God who dealt with Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob is going to deal with his people again and bring them out of captivity and give them a mountain, a place to worship, a high place. There's nothing wrong with worshiping on the high places if it's a high place that God designated. Now we get to where we left off last week. Verse 13, Moses said to God, Behold, I'm going to the sons of Israel, and I will say to them, The God of your father has sent me. They will say to me, Well, what is his name? What shall I say to them? Now maybe God could have said, Well, you're to say to them that I'm El Shaddai, the Almighty God, the God who made promises to the fathers, uh, the God who delivered people out of Egypt before and put them on mountains, and I'm going to do it again. But God says, This is what you will say. God said to Moses, I am that I am. And he said, Thus you shall say to the sons of Israel, I am has sent me to you. Now this is this name, Yahweh, Jehovah, Lord, all capital letters. I am. Yah, Hayah is the verb form. Yahweh, Yahweh, Jehovah is the noun form. And this is the name God gives them at that time. And we talked about that last week. This is the name that means I am constant. El Shaddai, the patriarchal name, means I am powerful, all-powerful. And when I promise something, you can trust me because I'm all-powerful and I'll bring it to pass. This name means I am constant. I am. I'm the God who keeps the promises. And so it's appropriate at this point in history to reveal that name, you see. Because now the promises that were made 400 years earlier are going to be kept. So it becomes appropriate to give this name at this time in history. Now, the Jews had used that name before, Lord Yahweh, but the full meaning of it hadn't been revealed to them. And when we get to Exodus 6, we'll look at that just a little bit more, because it's laid out in more detail there. Verse 15, And God furthermore said to Moses, Thus you shall say to the sons of Israel, Yahweh, here's that new name, the constant God, the God of your fathers, the God of Abraham, the God of Isaac, and the God of Jacob has sent me to you. This is my name forever, the name Yahweh, the constant God, the unchanging God. I am the Lord, I change not. This is my memorial name to all generations. Now, what's a memorial name? Just think about that just for a minute. In the Bible, when God sets up a memorial of a covenant, is that to remind us? Or is it to remind him? That's right. The rainbow was to remind God, and that's very important because we got to always think back. In Genesis chapter 9, God says, I establish my covenant with you and with your seed after you. This is 9-9. Nine, nine. And he said, This is the sign of the covenant that I'm making between me and every creature. I will set my war bow in the cloud. And this shall be a sign of the covenant between me and the earth. And it shall come to pass when I bring a cloud over the earth and the bow shall be seen in the cloud, I will remember my covenant. Verse 16, when the bow is in the cloud, then I will look upon it to remember the everlasting covenant. So memorials in the Bible, while they remind us, primarily they to remind God, so he doesn't forget. Now, is there any real possibility that God is going to forget? No. So this becomes kind of circular here. But God sets up the covenant for us to realize that he is reminding himself. Now, in the book of Revelation, we won't look at it, but in chapter 4, we find that God sits on the throne above the crystal sea, and around him is a rainbow. So every time God looks at the earth, he's looking through the rainbow, so he's always reminded. And in Revelation chapter 10, when Jesus appears with one foot on the sea and one foot on the land, there's a rainbow around his head. So whenever God looks at the world, he looks through the rainbow, so he's always reminded. Now, in the Old Testament, there were a lot of memorials like that. You may remember a little bit later on when they crossed through the Jordan River and the waters divide. They were told to put 12 stones out in the middle of the river as memorials. Now, a couple of hours later, the river started to flow again, and nobody could see those stones. They were underwater. So who were they there to remind? Well, basically to remind God. Now, we get reminded, too. The Lord's Supper is a memorial, and it's not to remind us about the death of Jesus. It does that, but primarily it's to remind God. He says, do this as my memorial. We say, do this in memory of me, we think, oh well, it's there to remind us about Jesus. That's true, 
But see, we've already been reminded or we wouldn't be doing it. Now we remind God. Do this to remind me to keep the covenant. We all know what it is to plead the promises. It's the same idea. God gives these memorials and he says, hold this up to me. Hold up this memorial and remind me. God wants us to do that. He wants us to pray in Jesus' name because that's memorial name. His name, Yahweh, becomes Jesus. And in the New Testament, that's the memorial name. We pray in Jesus' name. That reminds God. Is he going to forget? No. But it's good for us to remind him. We can be reminded, but by itself, that's just a sentimental idea. Oh, well, you know, think about Jesus on the cross. God wants this turned into something dynamic, turned into prayer, to where we remind him. The New Testament says we show forth the death of Christ until he comes. Who are we showing it to? Well, we're not showing it to the world because it's in worship. The world isn't here. Worship isn't the danger. We're showing it to God. You do this memorial, you show it forth to God and remind him. Jesus died, and he earned the Holy Spirit, and we need to be blessed. We remind him. So God gives them this name, you see. He gives them something that they can use in prayer to remind him. This is my memorial name to all generations. These memorials do remind us, but the primary thing is that they remind God. He gives them to us so that we can use them to remind him. That's the amazing thing. We're given the right to go into his presence and demand that he keep the covenant because he gave us these memorials. And that's what David does in the Psalms. I mean, he goes in and he's pretty bold. He says, hey, you've cast me off. I'm in pain. This hurts. Where are you? You gave me this memorial name. Where are you, Lord? Where are you, Yahweh? You promise. He demands. And eventually God answers. He doesn't always answer right away. Sometimes he wants us to go through a dark night of the soul so that we come to be more desperate for his presence. But we can remind him. So God gives them this name. He gave them the name All-Powerful 400 years earlier. Now he gives them this name. This is the name to remind God by. Verse 16. Go and gather the elders of Israel together and say to them, Yahweh, the God of your fathers, the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, has appeared to me, saying, Visiting, I have visited you. Literally, God visits, things change. God lives in heaven, and he's always with us, but sometimes he comes in a special way, and when he does, history moves forward, big jumps. Things change. I'm visiting you. I'm concerned about you as a way to paraphrase that. And what has been done to you in Egypt? If we look back at Genesis 50, well, it's just one page back, 24 and 25, this is what Joseph says to his brothers. Now, this is about 200 years earlier, less than that, about 150 years earlier. Joseph said to his brothers, I'm about to die, but God will surely take care of you. But look over in the margin and it says, God will surely visit you. God will visit you and bring you up from this land of the land he promised on oath. To Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. Then Joseph made the sons of Israel swear, saying, God will surely visit you, and you will carry my bones up from here. Now, 150 years later, I have to look at the chronology to know when this was, God comes and he says, I am going to visit. I'm going to fulfill the promise that I made through Joseph a century or so ago. So it connects. When Moses says this to the elders, they're supposed to understand that what God has said to Joseph and what they've been living for, that the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob was going to visit them, that's now coming to pass. Only difference is, it says, the Lord, the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, is going to visit. See, we have this added factor here. The faithful God is going to fulfill his promises. Verse 17, So I said, I will bring you up. We're still paraphrasing Genesis 50. Joseph says, I will bring you up from Israel to the land he promised. God says, So I said, I will bring you up out of the affliction of Egypt to the land of the Canaanite, the Hittite, the Amorite, the Perizzite, the Hivite, and the Jebusite, to a land that is flowing with milk and honey. And they will listen to what you say. They will hear your voice. And you, with the elders of Israel, will come to the king of Egypt, and you will say to him, The Lord, the God of the Hebrews, has met with us. 
So now please let us go a three days' journey into the wilderness that we may sacrifice to the Lord our God. But I know that the king of Egypt will not permit you to go except by a strong hand. Remember earlier in this paragraph, God said he would break the hand of Pharaoh. Now God says he will use his hand. Why a three days' journey? Remember? The third day, third month, third year. It's always a time of judgment and resurrection in the Bible. Three days' journey, and we get to the place where God makes covenants, where God makes changes. Now, this is interesting. I thought that God was going to deliver the people. But the demand that he puts in front of Pharaoh is, just let him go have a worship festival. What if Pharaoh said, yeah, you guys can go have your festival and just come on back? Could Pharaoh have done that? And we know he didn't. But what is this predicament that this puts Pharaoh into? If Pharaoh allows them to go out to Mount Sinai, three-day journey, into the wilderness or anywhere else to sacrifice, if he does that, he is recognizing that Yahweh is the true master of Israel. See, we've got a contest here. Who owns the Hebrews? Whose slaves are they? Are they Yahweh's slaves? Or are they Pharaoh's slaves? And if Yahweh comes and says, I demand that you let my slaves come and worship me for three days, then, okay. But if Pharaoh acknowledges that, he is recognizing Yahweh as Israel's master. And then he's got a problem, you see. Then he's got a problem. Because then he has to realize that he only has them on loan. And there's another problem implied in this. If they are Jehovah's slaves, then they are under his laws. We're going to have to look at this in some detail as we go. But the law says, we'll find later on, if you have a Hebrew slave, for six years he will serve, but in the seventh year he goes free. Now how long had Pharaoh had these slaves? A whole lot more than seven years. The law also says, if you marry a girl, a slave wife, and you abuse her, she can go free. Has Pharaoh been abusing the Hebrew women? So legally, they get to go free if they come under biblical law. So now Pharaoh is in a bind, because he knows more about this than you think he knows. These Hebrews have been here all this time. The customs were known. Joseph had educated them. They knew something about what was going on. Just as our secular humanists in America, they know something about Christianity. And now Pharaoh is going to learn more as Moses interacts with him. But you see, if Pharaoh recognizes that the Hebrews are really Yahweh's slaves, then he is going to have to acknowledge that he's just got them on loan, and that long ago the contract was up, and so he's got to let them go. Another predicament that this would put Pharaoh in, possibly, is Pharaoh would have to recognize that this Jehovah that this God is the true God. And if he does that, then he has to do what Joseph's Pharaoh did, and that's convert. And if he converts, what did Joseph's Pharaoh do with Israelites, the Hebrews? Well, he honored them. Gave them a special place to live. And so Pharaoh is in a bind. If he bows the knee in a true evangelical sense and recognizes God as true God, he's going to have to let the Hebrews go and honor them because they're the priestly nation. Those who bless you, I will bless. Just like Pharaoh of Joseph's day did. On the other hand, if he doesn't want to bow the knee, and yet in some mere legal sense he recognizes that Jehovah is the true master of the Jews and is entitled to this demand here, then he's going to have to let him go anyway. Because he realizes that he's only got him on loan from the true master. And time's up. The true master wants him back. Now, the important thing to notice here is the entire issue of their political and cultural freedom was founded in their religious freedom. The bottom line was religious freedom. And our forefathers understood that. We tend to forget it. Mm -hmm. We tend to become more concerned about political maneuvering than we are about religious freedom. And it's important to be involved in all areas of life. We've got to remember what comes first. God didn't go to Pharaoh and say, let my people go to the land and form a theocracy. They were going to do that. But the place where he struck was at the root. 
and the root was, let them go that they may worship me. Because if they can do that, they can do anything. And Pharaoh knew that. We're so used to separating church and state that we don't think about that right away. But they didn't think that way back then. They saw that society was organically connected. If Pharaoh let them go and worship, Pharaoh was going to have to let them do what they want. He'd have to make some changes. He'd have to quit massacring them. But realize that they belong to someone else. So God says in verse 19, I know that this isn't going to work. Pharaoh's heart's going to be hardened and he's not going to let you go. So I will stretch out my hand and strike Egypt with all my miracles that I will do in the midst of it. And after that, he will let you go. Since he won't acknowledge me as God, then I'm going to force him to acknowledge me as God. And when he finally does acknowledge me as God, he will let you go. And again, this is not a matter just of power. God can put forth his power and blast them any time he wants. But when he went into Egypt, he didn't just put forth his power and blast Egypt. The first thing he did was kill the Nile God, which was the number two God in the system. Or number three. And the next of the last thing he did was kill the sun god, the three days of darkness. And the sun was the number two god in the system. And the last thing he did was kill the firstborn son, including the firstborn son of Pharaoh. And Pharaoh was the number one god in the system. So it's a war of the gods. And God makes them realize that he is the god. And then they have to let him go. So that's what's going to happen. God's hand will break the hand of Pharaoh. Now, verses 21 and 22 says, this theme we've looked at before, we'll look at it again. I will grant this people favor in the sight of the Egyptians, that is, I will grant the Hebrews. And it shall be that when you go, you will not go out empty handed. Every woman shall ask of her neighbor. Now, your version may say borrow, but that's an unfortunate translation. Maybe the word borrow in 1611 had a broader meaning than it has today. But if you borrow something, you need to pay it back. That's not what the Hebrew word here means. It just means ask. Ask as a gift. Every woman shall ask as a gift of her neighbor and the woman who lives in her house. Articles of silver and articles of gold and for clothing, and you will put them on your sons and daughters, and thus you will plunder the Egyptians. Well, we can say, yeah, you get to have all this spoil. Back wages for all the years of slavery. And that's true. But here again, there are some specific things in the law that point to this. For instance, Deuteronomy 15:13, If your kinsman, a Hebrew man or woman, is sold to you, then he shall serve you six years, but in the seventh year you shall set him free. And when you set him free, you shall not send him away empty-handed. When you set your slave free, you give him some gifts. So that's one reason why they're entitled to ask for gifts under God's law. Exodus 21 Verse 2, here's another slam. If you buy a Hebrew slave, you shall serve for six years, but on the seventh he shall go out as a free man without payment. Deuteronomy 15, after that you give him a gift. Here it says he serves only six years. Well, they have served for a lot longer than that. So they're owed restitution. So the gifts that you get when you go free, which when we look at the laws of slavery, we'll see how nice that is. Helps to set you up in business now that your indentured servitude is over. They did this in New England. When the indentured servitude was over, they would give them gifts and help them get going in business. Exodus 21, verse 2, would indicate that they're owed restitution. And then Exodus 21, 26 also is going to play into this. Exodus 21, 26, if a man strikes the eye of his male or female slave and destroys it, he shall let him go free on account of his eye. He knocks out a tooth of a male or female slave, he shall let him go free on account of his tooth. So if you oppress your slaves, they get to go free. All of these are reasons why the Hebrews need to be let free. But specifically, they're entitled to ask. And we will return to the question of why it's the woman who is entitled to ask later on. I didn't bring my notes on that today, so rather than giving you the happy information on it, we'll get all of it. But we'll find every time that it's the woman who asks for the gifts, the woman who gets the gifts. And there's an idea of dowry there that we will look at. Moses answered and said, What if they won't listen to me or listen to what I say? Now, of course, Moses would naturally think that. Why? They didn't listen before, 40 years earlier, when he tried to help them. You know, Moses isn't really excited about going back to this church. Now, this is like the church that kicks you out as a pastor, and then they want you back. 
You're just not really excited about going back there. And you can imagine why. What if they won't listen to what I say? They may say, this Yahweh has not appeared to you. Hey, who made you a prince and a judge over us? Who do you think you are? We've resented you all these years anyway. You grew up in this royal family. You had it nice. You had everything you wanted. You had steak every night. You had it real good for 40 years as Pharaoh's daughter, prince of Egypt, educated at the best universities in Egypt. And now you're coming and telling us that God has appeared to you. This is just really fantastic. You have all these benefits, and of course the Jews resented him for that. And now he claims that God has spoken to him. I mean, just look at it. It puts Moses in a bad position. Well, God has to give him some miracles to prove it. The Lord said to him, What's that in your hand? And he said, A staff. And he said, Throw it to the ground. So he threw it to the ground and became a serpent, and Moses fled from it. The Lord said to Moses, Stretch out your hand and grasp it by its tail. So he stretched out his hand and caught it, and it became a staff in his hand, that they may believe that Yahweh, the God of their fathers, the God of Abraham, the God of Isaac, and the God of Jacob has appeared to you. And God furthermore said to him, Now put your hand into your bosom. So he put his hand into his bosom, and when he took it out, behold, his hand was leprous like snow. And he said, Put your hand into your bosom again. So he put his hand into his bosom again, and when he took it out of his bosom, behold, it was restored like the rest of his flesh. And it shall come about, if they don't believe you or he the witness of the first sign, that they may believe the witness of the last sign. But it shall be that if they do not believe you, even these two signs are heed what you say. Then you shall take some water from the Nile and pour it on the dry ground. The water that you take from the Nile will become blood on the dry ground. How many signs here? Three. There's two, and then there's three. Verse eight. It shall come about if they don't believe the first sign, they may believe the witness of the second sign. But if those two aren't good enough, then I'll give you a third. How does the Bible say anything is substantiated? By two or three witnesses. At the mouth of two or three witnesses. And that's a pattern. We'll see. God gives two and he says, oh, I'll give you one more. Two is enough. Get one more. Kind of a Trinitarian theme there. God reveals himself to us in word and sacrament. In the Son and the Spirit. And also in the Father. You always get a word and a sign in the Old Testament and in the New. Moses says... What if they don't just listen to my words? And so God gives us a miracle sign. In the church we have the same thing. We have word and sacrament, which is a miracle. I mean, there's a mystery connected with the sacrament. Christ gives himself to us in some mysterious way that we don't understand. Throughout the Old Testament, God always confirms his word with a sign. And so it is here. It's not wrong to ask for a sign. God has designed us to want a sign. It's wrong to ask for a sign in unbelief. But it's not wrong to expect a sign. God is three in one, and he reveals himself to us in more than one way. Sometimes Protestant people think, well, we ought to just trust the word alone and not need a sign. But God has designed us to need the sign. That's why he gives us the sacraments as well as the word. He really gives us three things, persons, word, and sacrament. Those are the three avenues of ministry in the church, person, word, and sacrament. The Father, the Son, and the Spirit. And we are designed to need those three things. So it's not a bad thing when you ask for a sign. What's bad is when you ask for another one, and another one, and another one, and another one. Then you got a problem. we got that problem in the church today, in my opinion. People are not satisfied with the Lord's Supper as a sign. So they want to have all kinds of other miracles. We don't need all those other miracles. Now look at the first one. We'll have time to look at this. This is complicated. This is one of the difficult passages in the Bible to figure out what it means. It's not hard to figure out what happened. Moses had a staff in his hand. It was his shepherd's staff. He threw it down on the ground and it became a snake. Moses ran away from it. God said, I want you to do something that requires a whole lot of faith. Grab that snake by the tail, which you would not normally do. If you're going to grab a snake, you grab it behind the head so it can't strike you. You don't grab it by the tail. It's sure to strike you. And Moses knows about snakes. When you live in Egypt, you know about snakes. And when you've been out in the wilderness for 40 years, you know all about snakes. Remember later on, there are a whole bunch of fiery serpents that are going to come up against these people. There are snakes everywhere out there. There are more snakes there than there are here. Moses knew about snakes, and the last thing you do is grab a snake by the tail. And God says to do that. 
And so as soon as he does, it becomes staff in his hand. Now this has to mean something, and this is what I think it means. The staff is a sign of technology. It is an extension of the man, and that's what technology is. God never designed us to have dominion over the world or to work without using technology. Technology is things or tools that you make to assist in your work or anything you do. And so they're extensions of you. Now, if you want to see how pro-technological the Bible is, just think about circumcision. God required, as a way of getting into the priestly nation in the Old Testament, that people circumcise themselves. There is no way you can do circumcision without technology. You can't do it by hand. You have to make a knife and use a knife. Moreover, this is technology that alters human beings. Now, this is kind of an issue for our Catholic friends. They say, well, you can't use artificial contraception because that's technology. You can only use natural birth control methods like rhythm because there is an anti-technological bias in their thinking. What's natural and non-technological is good. But technology is dangerous. The Bible is pro-technological and says you can use technology to alter human life. You can change your teeth. You can straighten your back. You can use technology to alter human life. And God has this put right at the beginning of his kingdom in the Old Testament. The use of technology. Now Moses' staff is technology. is an extension of his hand. An extension of who he is. He uses it to keep the sheep in line. And we assume that he's doing a good job. Later on, Moses is going to use this staff to bring the plagues upon Egypt. He's going to use it to divide the Red Sea. In Numbers chapter 17, when there is an assault upon Aaron's authority, each of the tribes brings a rod representing itself and plants it in the ground. And Aaron's rod is the one that blossoms and turns white, indicating eldership. Those rods represent the people. They represent and extend the person. That's what a staff does. Now, one of the things this implies is, and this would be another subject, but that we are responsible for technology and its use. You invent something, you're responsible for it. You use something, you're responsible for it. It won't do to say, well, I'm just a technician here and I'm working on this dangerous project, but I don't have any responsibility at all. You do have some responsibility for technology, but that would be another subject to discuss all the ins and outs of that and where the parameters lie. The thing to see now is that it is an extension of Moses, and it represents something. Moses' staff represents his power as a shepherd, and he is called to relinquish it. He's got to give up all of his power. You can't shepherd sheep by hands alone. Sheep are too dumb. You've got to have a staff. And Moses has to give it up, throw it to the ground. It becomes a serpent. The serpent represents Satan and Egypt. Back in the beginning, it represents Satan. At this juncture in history, Satan is working through Egypt. He's attacking the bride. He's attacking the seed. Remember Genesis 3.15, the war against the bride, the war against the seed. Satan is attacking both. He wants to keep the girl babies alive. He wants to kill the boy babies. He's attacking the girls to make them wives. He's attacking the boys to put them to death. He's the serpent, Egypt. That's what the snake represents. Now, how come the staff turns into the snake? Moses' staff becomes the serpent. That's the problem. And this is how I understand it. That God had allowed the Hebrews to shepherd Egypt. When Joseph came in, he became the shepherd of Egypt. Pharaoh gave all power into his hand. Joseph actually says, I have been made a father to Pharaoh. Pharaoh doesn't do anything without checking with me first. This Pharaoh might have been a young man in Joseph's day, you know. Maybe he even looked up to Joseph. It's hard to know. One thing's for sure. Joseph and the Hebrews in alliance with him were basically ruling Egypt through their influence. They were the shepherds of Egypt. And how well did they do not too well, because we find out that they were committing idolatry. If Egypt became a bad nation, it's because the church failed to do her job. Isn't that what the Bible says a thousand times? If my people will repent, I'll cleanse their land. 
If a man's ways please the Lord, he makes his enemies to be at peace with him. If Egypt went bad, it's because the Hebrews failed in their job of shepherding. What did Adam do when God gave him a garden? He gave it over to the devil. What did the Jews do when God gave them Egypt to shepherd? They sinned and produced the serpent, gave it to the serpent. This is what happens in America when the church fails to do her job, the serpent rises up. It's our fault. See? It's not somebody else's fault. Jesus says, all power is given to me, and I've given it to you. And if you blow it, it's your fault. We can't view the world as if the enemy out there is the main problem. The main problem is God's people aren't doing their job. If we do our job, the rest of it will clear up. We all know this. It's hard to know exactly what to do about it, but we can start here. And I think that's what's going on here. I think that's why Moses' staff becomes a serpent. It indicates that the Hebrews, in their influence, their governing influence over Egypt, the influence that comes from spiritual salt and light, they had given rise to the serpent through their failures. I don't know any other way to unify the symbolism here. Now, Moses is told to grasp it by the tail, a dangerous place. And that snake, you can expect it's going to turn around and snap at Moses. And that's what Pharaoh is going to do. See, Moses is being sent to Egypt now, and he's got to grasp the serpent by the tail. What does that mean? He's going to go and he's going to talk to Pharaoh. He's going to grab Pharaoh by the tail. If Pharaoh doesn't like it, what's the first thing Pharaoh does? Double the tail of bricks. Then the Hebrew taskmaster will come to Moses and say, well, you just made things worse for us. And every time Moses goes in and grabs Pharaoh by the tail, Pharaoh strikes back until finally Pharaoh's power is broken. So he's got to grasp the serpent by the tail. Hebrews have given rise to this serpent by not shepherding well. Now they have to grab it by the tail. It's risky. It requires faith, but that's what you've got to do. And it will turn back into the staff, which means Israel will be victorious. Now, if the staff represents the technology of Egypt, which was initially given to Joseph's hand, and now has become a serpent, and now has gone back into Moses' hand, then that means that all the technology and all the gold and silver and everything that is in Egypt is going to be given into Israel's hand. The serpent, Egypt, is now in Moses' hand and becomes a staff. Now, how does that work out? What happens with all the spoils of Egypt? What do they do with it? They make the tabernacle out of it. Israel's power, their staff, will be built on the spoils of Egypt. The wicked lay up, but the righteous inherit. So let me review how I see this. The reason I think this is a sign and what it has to do with is the staff represents Israel's government over Egypt. It represents Egypt in a sense, in all the things that are there. They have done a bad job of governing it, and it has become a serpent. When they grab it by the tail in faith, it will become their servant again. They will get the technology. Well, that may or may not convince you. But that's how I see it. A way to pull all this together. And that is, in fact, what's going to happen. They will grab the serpent by the tail. The serpent will turn into a staff, something they can use, something that will help them. The next sign is actually the first reference to leprosy in the Bible. Moses puts his hand into his bosom and becomes leprous. He comes back out again. Now maybe here again, this is just a miracle so that the people go, oh wow, look at that. Or maybe it means something. Of course, I think it means something. <laughs> I don't think God ever does miracles just so the people get an oh wow experience. But we'll have to look at what it means because... We all have misconceptions about what leprosy is to start with, and then what leprosy signifies, and then we'll be able to understand the meaning of the symbolism here. Why his hand would become leprous when he puts it in his bosom, why it would become clean when he puts it back in. What does that mean? Any questions over this? Huh? Well, First of all, technology can only really take off in the Christian society and to the extent that a society is Christian because only Christianity says the world is not sacred and spooky. And to the extent 
that you're not Christian, if you're semi-Christian, as in Catholicism, to that extent the world is still spooky, and so you don't mess with it. You have natural law and natural this and nature and mother nature, and it's spooky, so you don't fool with it. To the extent to which you become Christian, the world is simply a tool. Only God is spooky. <laughs> and so, the more consistent Christianity comes into the world, the more free technology becomes. Now, technology can be perverted, and that's what humanism does, but essentially, without Christianity, you don't have it. So in the Middle Ages, you have a big technological advance, but it only goes so far. After the Reformation, you have another big technological advance. And that's why the Bible is pro-technological. It's not technophobic. And that's why your Anabaptist dropout sects that say, oh, well, we don't want to use machines and we don't want to use buttons because they're too technological and so forth. That's a very, very non-Christian outlook to not fear technology. The other question is, when the lion lies down with the lamb and people live long lives, will that be due to technology or just due to God changing the world? I don't know the answer to that. And I know that Gary North has said things like maybe the advances in technology are what will bring about the millennial conditions that are described. Maybe, but maybe it's just God changing things. God changed people's lifespan before and after the flood, apparently without any technological aspects to it. So I don't know the answer to that. But I do think it's true. One of the blessings of Christianity is technology and medical technology, and one of the benefits of that is people live longer, healthier lives. And that's all good, in spite of the fact that along the way there are problems. Some people put too much trust in technology. That becomes another form of idolatry. Let's pray. Father in heaven, we thank you for the encouragement of your word. We thank you for delivering your people in the past. We ask that you would deliver us today, and in our day, from the powers of the serpent around us. Help us to have the strength and the faith to grant the wicked by the faith and see it turned into the serpent to you. We thank you for the